Hello, I'm Jonathan Ross. The documentary you're about to watch means an awful lot, to me at least. It's probably the most personal program I've ever been involved in, and it deals with a subject that I find intensely fascinating, compellingly important, shamefully unexplored, and largely undocumented. It deals with the history of comic books, and the history of one comic book character in particular. That's Spider-Man, of course. I have very little doubt that you have, at the very least, heard of him. He's very famous. Spider-Man is one of those handful of fictional creations who is instantly recognisable the world over. An entertainment brand worth billions of dollars to the company that owned him, but not, of course, to the men who created him back in the early 60s. In fact, of the two men most directly linked with the creation of Spider-Man, one of them receives hardly any credit at all, has accepted no money from the millions of dollars generated by the movies and the endless stream of merchandising that accompanies them, and lives a modest, intensely private life in New York City. He's never given an in-depth interview to anyone. He hasn't really spoken about the creation of his work ever. And yet his artistic talent and brilliant body of work have probably given me more pleasure in my life than any other person working in any of the entertainment industries. His name is Steve Ditko, and I'm going looking for him. This is one of only three or four photographs of the elusive Steve Ditko known to exist. And trust me, I spent an inordinate amount of time searching for others. Why? Well, I'm more than just a little bit obsessed by his work. Ever since I first saw his art, I was hooked. More than any other comic book artist, his work stays with you. It is far more dramatic, far more insanely imaginative, and far more personal than it needs to be. His style is unique, and from the little I know about him, his life seems just as unusual and perhaps as strange as his work. Although Spider-Man is probably Ditko's crowning achievement, he'd worked in the comic book industry for many years before that character first appeared in 1962. And he continued creating bizarre and colourful characters for many decades after he stopped breathing life into everyone's favourite wall crawler. But Spider-Man is still the one character that fans return to. Now, Spider-Man was different. He was about as far removed from the chisel-jawed adults like Superman and Batman who previously dominated the scene. Spider-Man was a character that puny, bespectable comic book fans like me could directly relate to. Superman was an all-powerful alien. Batman, an orphaned multi-millionaire who lived above a cave filled with jets and cars and shared his life with a young boy in tights. Nice work if you could get it, but clearly fantasies. Spider-Man, on the other hand, was a puny, unpopular teenager who lived with his old aunt and uncle and endured the same kind of hell every day at school that most of his readers did. We loved him because before he had the good fortune to get bitten by a radioactive spider, we were him. My love of comic books goes back to when I was a kid. This is me enjoying one of my favourites back in 1969. Although actually, I wasn't really that cool, I'm afraid, so you're going to have to go, mate. I was more like this. Come on in. Yeah, enjoy that. And like some kids are obsessed with sport and others with taking fast cars without the owner's consent and driving them around run-down estates before inevitably enjoying a short stay at Her Majesty's Pleasure, I lived and breathed for the joy that these cheaply produced four-colour epics gave me. Although, to be honest, I wasn't able to afford this one until I was about 30, so I'm going to have to take that off you, and you won't see that again for over 20 years, mate. You might think I am alone in my adoration of Spider-Man. You might think that I am somehow socially or emotionally retarded to still have such great passion for something aimed essentially at children and created almost 50 years ago. But I am not alone. I begin my quest to discover more about Steve Ditko right here in London. And that a great cover. Look, you know. Now, the easily upset among you might wish to turn away. You see before you three grown men indulging themselves in their passion for comics in a room I have at home dedicated to those four colour masterpieces. My name is Paul Gambaccini and I am a Steve Ditko reader since 1960. <laughs> Paul loves the early Spider-Man books as much for the human drama they contain as the superheroics. It's the ultimate soap opera. It's, it was really probably the first soap opera for us, school students, that we ever were exposed to. 
They had personal problems. They weren't just invulnerable heroes who had a weakness such as the color yellow or green kryptonite. Uh, these were, were characters whose problems were they loved an old woman who they had to support, and May in this case. What made Ditko's Spider-Man so different was that these problems were the problems that the audience had. He was in high school. So he had to struggle to get good grades, but he, after the murder of Uncle Ben, he had to earn enough money to support himself and Aunt May. So he's the breadwinner. Plus he's a student, plus he's a superhero. Oh my God, how do you do all three at once? Oh, yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah, yeah. Just like Paul and myself, Mark Miller is also a big Ditko fan, and in 2004 he realized his dream of becoming the first and thus far only Brit to write the Spider-Man series. When I did Spider-Man, the only stuff I read as research was, you know, the the, the Ditko run, because uh, to me that was the heart of it. It was it was the, the seed that was planted. That's the, that's now Spider-Man. Everything that made Spider-Man successful um, in the beginning is the opposite of what what is big now. You know, big flashy stylized art and good-looking people is what sells comics now. But back then, the ugliness and the orderliness is what made it a big hit. It was about everyday stuff, and nobody for me epitomised that more than probably Ditko. I would say. Although Ditko was responsible for the art, the man behind the scripting was the legendary Stan Lee. Although together they only produced less than 40 Spider-Man adventures, the huge impact they had on the comic book industry is undeniable. But just as Spider-Man's popularity was beginning to soar, helping Marvel to become the number one company in the business, Steve Ditko walked away from the character without a word of warning. Of course, there have been rumours, there's been speculation, there's been gossip, but Steve Ditko has never spoken out about why he walked out, and not knowing still drives me a little bit nuts. To unravel the mystery of Steve Ditko, I need to delve deeper into the world of the comic book creator. So I'm going to meet some of the most talented and opinionated people working in the comic book industry today, in the hope that they can offer me some insight. In my opinion, there are only a handful of comic creators who really deserve to be considered masters. Steve Ditko is one, Jack Kirby another, and Stan Lee, the man they both worked with for many years, a third. But if I were forced to offer an opinion as to who is the greatest talent still working in comics today, then I wouldn't even hesitate. His name is Moore, Alan Moore, and like me, he's a Ditko fan. But unlike me, he chooses to live and work in Northampton. I've had my jabs, Northampton, here I come. <laughs> Along with Frank Miller, Alan Moore is widely regarded as one of the saviours of the modern comic book. He released Watchmen in 1986, reinventing the graphic novel with its dark and twisted view of humanity. At Overston Park, Northampton, the Caravan Club holds its annual rally with hundreds of caravans from all over the country, and it's an ideal holiday for the kiddies. Now, I wonder what's behind that screen. My name is Alan Moore. I am a comic writer and magician living in Northampton. I probably first encountered Steve Ditko's work when I was seven or eight. Uh, I probably wouldn't even have known that it was Steve Ditko at the time. There was a kind of elegance, a tormented elegance to the way that his characters stood, the way that they bent their hands. There was something even in the the nine panel page grids that he used to habitually use that brought a kind of claustrophobia, a kind of paranoia to the work. His characters always looked very highly strung. They always looked as if they were on the edge of some kind of revelation or breakdown. There was something a bit feverish about Steve Ditko and uh, I pursued my love of Ditko well into adulthood and it became a kind of low-level addiction. And there was something about the way that Ditko handled a superhero in Spider-Man, which made it a feature of the, the urban landscape. Um, in Superman and Batman, buildings were just to be flown past. But as with Jack Kirby, Steve Ditko brought this quality to his cityscapes that had real character. It was a slightly paranoid and shadowy character, but that suited very much the kind of introspective, often 
melancholy mood of a lot of those early Spider-Man episodes. New York was an inspiration for Ditko. In 1953, he moved there from a small mining town in Pennsylvania and made it his and Spider-Man's home. Here comes the Spider-Man. And it was here that he joined the cartoonist and illustrator's school. I went uptown to meet his mentor and teacher, one of the true pioneers of the comic book industry, Jerry Robinson. Well, I guess I'm best known in the comic 